Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church this morning in our service of uh, worship and love to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God in heaven. Welcome to everyone here and a special welcome to everyone online and also to if you're uh, all our visitors are here. If you're visiting here, we certainly welcome you and welcome you to join with us in weekly service here. If you're if you're a visitor or if you're uh, a member, please sign the registers located at the end of each row so we can have that information. Like a couple of announcements this morning, um, Christian Simply is, is extended to Jeanette George and the unexpected death of her sister, Mary Butler, in, in Kentucky. She's not with us today, so we'd like to remember her in our thoughts and our prayers as we move forward. As to anyone in this community, in this church that's... Uh, going through a time of need. Um, we, um, this past week, I don't have any other special announcements right now, but this past week, part of the uh, mission of our church and the Christian church at large is uh, the welfare of its members and the community around it, but also the education and the, uh, of our young, men, young boys and girls in the ways of the Lord. Uh, part of that is done through uh, Sunday school and worship services and youth programs, but also through uh, Vacation Bible School. We had Vacation Bible School at this church this past week, and it was a very, very good success. I'd like to call on um, Kate Thomas to come up and give us a report on Vacation Bible School this week. Good morning. And happy summer. Um, so VBS was a wonderful experience. Um, it was a huge success, and all the kids really seemed to have a great, great time. Um, so it really was a countywide v VBS. We had children from 14 present churches. Um, it was a com combination of Clinton and us, and we were the two main churches coming together to do this VBS. We had children that came as far as Hodges, Mountville, Hickory Tavern, Simpsonville, and Gray Court. And we averaged about 34 kids per day, and that's a huge increase from what we've had in the past just doing it from our church. So we would like to say a special thanks to Will Delaney. I know some of these people that I mentioned are not here today, but Will Delaney, Laura James, who is the, the CE from, or the DCE from First Pres Clinton, and Elizabeth Myers, who is their uh, music coordinator also from First Pres in Clinton, um, for organizing this year's VBS along with the other members of our commission. We would also like to thank our dedicated volunteers, Ryland Edwards, Mary Bab Davis, Gail Parker, Betsy Ellison, Margaret Davis, Jennifer McCracken, Annette Patterson, Lynn Todd, Hayden Todd, Julie Edwards, Leslie Mitchell, Kay Monroe, and all the volunteers from First Pres Clinton. And we are excited to collaborate with them again next year, and this time it will be at their home church. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. One other announcement, uh, I believe the Wednesday night Bible study that's led by Suzanne Lowry uh, gathered this past Wednesday night as, as an informational meeting, and that will continue uh, again this week, and I believe that's at 6 o'clock. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. Is that correct? Six o'clock. Okay, good. Um, obviously, Mike is not here today. He is with his family at the beach in Alabama on the sand. So we'll wish them a, a, a great time of, of uh, relaxation this week. In his absence, we have a dear friend of ours here today. I, I mentioned somebody said, "Would you make the announcements and and uh, uh, introduce our pastor today?" I said, "Well, Jim doesn't need an introduction, but we will do that." But we normally, Jim has been here with us. Jim Caprell is here with us from Simpsonville. He is, uh, he has, his position has been uh, with the Presbyterian Retirement Community, as he and I were talking a while ago, but he is now, as of a few months ago, he is retired from the Presbyterian Retirement Community. So, Jim, I know we talked a little bit about the retirement life, and uh, I know you'll enjoy it, you and Holly. And you're certainly welcome, you're deserving of, uh, of your time off. So we'd like to thank you for being here with us today and leading us in worship today. Good morning. God is good. And all the time. 
join me please in our call to worship we come to be to worship to be with God God is always with us Our hymn 415, Come Ye Sinners. Let's stand for it. favorite singer-songwriter of mine is named Kate Campbell. She grew up in Mississippi, still lives in Mississippi, I believe, um, and wrote a, uh, wrote a hymn based on, or a song based on this hymn, actually, and instead of 10,000 charms, the end of the, end of the hymn is called 10,000 Lures, and the, uh, the opening line, is, or the phrase, the uh, refrain starts out that the devil has a, a a uh, line for you, and it has 10,000 lures on it. Think about this past week and the lures that have been out there in your life. Did you bite? Or was it that power that it circles you and encircles you that keeps you away? I love the line, if, uh, if you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. It is time to come 
and make that confession of those times when our elbows rubbed a little uneasily against our neighbor this week. Maybe we forgot to say the thing we needed to or did the thing we shouldn't have done this past week. It is time for us to make that confession of who we are because that's who we are. And yet that's not who God receives us as, as a confessional, as one who is washed and one who is cleansed through Jesus Christ. Let us make our confession this morning using the prayer that is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray together. God, with us, even as we are mindful of your coming, we confess that you can seem far away. You are hidden when we need you near. In our hurt, doubt, and fear, we do not try to grow closer to you. Instead, we lash out against you, our neighbor, even those we love. Forgive us, we pray, and come to save us. Let your face shine until our tears are dried, our sins are faded, and our hope is restored. After all, we belong to you, and in your hands we can be made new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is true and can be believed that in Jesus Christ we come to offer our sin and find our lives changed. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Good morning. Good morning. Let's do it again. Good morning. Okay, that's better. Good to see you guys today. <clears throat> We're going to talk today about something called miracles. Do, do, what do you think when you hear a miracle? What is, what is a miracle? Can somebody give me a reasonable definition of what a miracle is? What's a miracle, Paul? A happy moment when somebody A happy moment? That's, that would be, yeah, mo the result of most miracles, yeah, they're happy, aren't they? Anything else? Can you think of a miracle? A miracle, when I think of a miracle, I think of something that just, that happens, but it, it, there's no logical reason for it to happen. Like, somebody says, that was a miracle, so there's no way, that, 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 that can't happen. That, you know, if I were to tell you, I can pick up that, that table right there with one finger, would you think I could do that? There's, there's no way I can do that, is there? No. But if, it would be a miracle if I could, wouldn't it be? You know, there, we're going to talk, one of the miracles we're going to talk about today is a guy named, a, a prophet named Elijah. Eli, a prophet is just someone that, that, that hears from the Lord, from God, and he puts out that word as God tells him to. So Elijah told the people some 
things and the people didn't like it that he told it to. So some people were mad. They were mad enough they wanted to hurt him. So God told him to go off to a, a isolated place by himself until things calmed down. So that's what he did. He went out in the country for a, a long time. So he stayed out there. So how do you think, what would you have to do to live? You got to do a couple of things, right? You got to drink and eat. That'd be two things you really got to do, right? So how do you think he, he drank for, well, God told him to go out by next to a brook, a creek, and he drank from the creek. But how would he get food? How would he get food? How do you think, Parker? Look for fish. Look for fish. That's good. That's good. But, you know, you might not always be able to get a fish, and you got to cook it, and you got to get it prepared and all. But that's good, yeah. Well, here's what God told him. God said he would command the birds, the ravens, to bring him bread and meat every morning and every night. Now, this part is not in the Bible. This is just me making this up. And so Elijah, on past this, let's, let's say Elijah gets back to his friends. And they say, man, where have you been? He said, well, I've, I've told the word of the Lord. Some people didn't like it. I had to go hide for a while. Yeah, we noticed you've been gone. Well, how'd you get by? Well, I drank from a brook. Well, how'd you eat? And he says, this is the part that you may not believe, but the birds brought me food every morning and every night. What do you think his friend said? No way, right? But Elijah said, way, yeah. It did, that's what happened. So a miracle is something that goes totally against what we think can happen. Our minds can't e can explain some things. So miracles, yeah, they're, they have happy endings. Most of the times they do. But the story today is not so much the miracle but it's the miracle maker. Maybe what we ought to do is there's, a, there's, a, there's something behind the miracle. John, one of the disciples, didn't call them miracles. You know what he called them? He called them signs. What does a sign do? It tells you something, right. And also, signs that have arrows, they kind of point you somewhere. That's what John's point was. The miracle is great, but they're pointing you to something else. So every time we hear about something that couldn't have happened when somebody is really, really sick and somehow, some way to get well, that's a miracle, most likely. So there's, there's a reason behind it, and there's a, there's a maker behind a miracle. And that's what we want to give thanks for, and that's what we don't ever want to lose sight of, okay? Let's pray, okay? Dear God, Dear God. we want to thank you that you love us so greatly. That you, love us so greatly. that you provide miracles in our lives. That you provide miracles in our lives. We want to make sure that we love you. We want to make sure that we love you. Amen. Our hymn is 439 as we bless our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me, please? <laughs>
Well, it is good to be, good to be back with you always uh, to the congregation here in Lawrence and to uh, bring you uh, this wonderful word today. Um, I still want to encourage you as a former, in, former employee of President Community of South Carolina to, um, to be involved in them as you have and thank you for your previous involvement and prior involvement uh, in that uh, wonderful ministry. Uh, and I would ask your prayers as well for the organization. Uh, it seemed like, it seems as if I started something when I retired the end of March because uh, two more chaplains have also, uh, one retired and one uh, moved to another position since then. So uh, they are in the process of looking for three, um, three chaplains for the, the uh, one at Florence in Columbia and, uh, and still here in the, in the Clinton area. So. I uh, just hope you would lift them up in your prayers for um, discernment and, uh, and, um, and wisdom in that pro progress. Let us come to God in prayer this morning as we lift up our time together. We lift our voices and we lift our psalms and our songs to you, O God, and offer them to you as our offering this morning in hopes that you would uh, bless us in our hearing and reading our considerations of your words to us, words that are ancient and new in our lives, made new by your spirit that is uh, powerfully moving in this place today. So open our eyes and open our ears open our hearts and our minds through these words this day in the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, <clears throat> thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture, <clears throat> excuse me, our first scripture this morning yeah. is from uh, the Old Testament book of First, sorry, First Kings, um, reading from the 17th chapter beginning at the 8th through the 16th verse. The text is in, in your bulletin, on the back page of your bulletin, uh, if you would like to uh, join and read along uh, with that. It's a great story about uh, the prophet Elijah and uh, a widow that he uh, happens upon, is asked to go visit with, is uh, there on, his, on a part, as a part of his journey uh, out in the desert. Uh, and it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful story. Listen for this word from uh, the book of Kings. The Lord's word came to Elijah. Get up from this woman's house, or from where he was uh, fed earlier, as uh, William said. Uh, get up and go to Zarephath near Sidon and stay there. I have ordered a widow there to take care of you. So Elijah went and left and went to Zarephath. As he came to the town gate, he saw a widow collecting sticks. He called out to her, please get a little water from me in this cup so I can drink. And she went to get some water. And he then said to her, please get me a little piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any food, only a handful of flour in a jar and a bit of oil in a bottle. Look at me. I'm collecting two sticks so I can make some food for myself and my son. We'll eat the last of the food and then die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go and do what you said, only make a little loaf of bread for me first and then bring it to me. You can make something for yourself and your son after that. This is what Israel's God, the Lord says, the jar of flour won't decrease and the bottle of oil won't run out until the day the Lord sends rain on earth. The widow went and did what Elijah said. So the widow and Elijah and the widow's household ate for many days. The jar of flour didn't decrease 
nor did the bottle of oil run out, just as the Lord spoke through Elijah. And after these things, the son of the widow, who was the matriarch of the household, became ill, and his sickness got <clears throat> steadily worse until he wasn't breathing anymore. And she said to Elijah, what's gone wrong between us, man of God? Have you come to call attention to my sin, my sin and kill my son? And Elijah said, give your son to me. And he took her son and carried him to an upper room where he was staying. And he laid him on his bed. And Elijah cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, why is it that you brought such evil upon this widow that I'm staying with by killing her son? And he stretched out himself over the boy three times and cried out, Lord, Please give this body's life back to him. And the Lord listened to Elijah's voice and gave the boy back his life, and he lived. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind Stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of hell assail, and my strength begins to fail. Thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. Stand by me when my foes in war array undertake to stop my way. Thou who saved Paul and Silas, stand by me. reading from the Gospel of Luke this morning and from the seventh chapter. A little later, <clears throat> Jesus went to a city called Nain. His disciples and a great crowd traveled with him. As he approached the city gate, a dead man was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the city was with her. When he saw her, the Lord had compassion for her and said, Don't cry. And he stepped forward and touched the stretcher on which the dead man was being carried. And those carrying him stood still. Jesus said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Awestruck, Everyone praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea 
and the surrounding region. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Stereotypes are quite common in our society today. If you're kind of business oriented and uh, focused on gaining and making sure your portfolios are all in order, you're kind of considered a conservative kind of folk, a person and, and, uh, and that's, that's kind of the, the stereotype that you have from that. If you wear Birkenstock sandals and drive a Subaru, you're likely to be a little bit more liberal than that. If you are um, uh, wear uh, uh, a certain type of dress that puts you in one type of uh, stereotype uh, and uh, uh, the way that we look, uh, the way we wear our hair, uh, the color of our hair uh, stereotypes us as to all into various little categories that we put ourselves, put others into. We don't like to do that, but oftentimes uh, it just it just happens. Again, that's part of our brokenness and our rubbing elbows and the wrong ways with people, perhaps for which we um, sought confession and received forgive, <clears throat> forgiveness this morning. The stereotypes can go on and on and on in our society. Now, the stereotypes they don't have to be true, but they are the perception nonetheless. If you live on this part of the city, on this side of the tracks, you have this income or no income. If you're over here in a gated community, then you have nothing to worry about. Your future is well set. It may well be that the reality is the opposite, but the perception is the truth oftentimes. And Elijah's day, this poor marginal widow woman was, uh, uh, had no male husband. Her husband had died, and, and there was no male in her husband's family, evidently, that would, uh, that would agree to adopt her into his own family, as was the law at the time. And she had a son who, who made things more economically difficult for her to survive, it might be that stereotypical picture we might paint of someone who was dirt poor in her day. You can see her, can't you? You can see the situation that she's in in your mind's eye. You can see her out there lingering at the back of the lines, a little bit of ashamed of her situation, hoping for just a morsel or two from what's left over in the bread line. There had been a severe drought in the land due to King Ahab's international trade policies where most of the importers had cut him off and there was nothing to grow out of the land for them to export into other nations or states around them. And so she had nothing. She and her son had only a little bit of cornmeal, Scripture says, a few drops of precious oil, and the water to live off of. And she knew the reality. Let me make this for you, she tells Elijah, and then we'll go and die. And then this uppity little prophet wants supper, and it tells her to go and do these things and to get this meal and to get the, uh, get the oil and promised her above all promises she's ever heard, that neither of them would run out until the drought was over, the rains came, the wheat grew, and the oil was produced again. All this took place there at the gates of this little town. And at the gates where all the discussions were held, where all debates were take, carried out, where all uh, judicial processes were always carried forth, uh, at the gates of this little town, she discovered who Elijah was and what he was asking. And dependent upon charity, how was she going to be able to help out Elijah, she was thinking. There are moments in our life, miracles we may call them, as with the children this morning, where something happens that we cannot really get our minds around. We 
things kind of float in and out of our lives, some things we pay attention to, some things not, that we might describe as a miracle later on. Sitting with, uh, uh, in the booth behind a colleague at work, perhaps, with whom you had a little tiff earlier in the day, and they show up in that booth for lunch. God has a way of sending messages to us and messengers to us, reminding us oftentimes that what we perceive as the problem really isn't a problem for God, that they really are small things in a very big universe. So there at the gate, Elijah shared with that woman about this God who could assure her of life when all she knew was death. Here she says, eat this, let me go and die. The former president of Columbia Seminary, Steve Hayner, said about this text, this ordinary, humble woman couldn't have imagined what her quiet act of hospitality would ultimately accomplish, nor that we would be reading her story 2,000 years, 3,000 years later. Imagine the staying power of such a story as having a full flask of oil that didn't run dry and a little wheat barrel that never went empty and enough there, just enough there to survive day in and day out until this drought was over. For 3,000 years, that little story has moved and shaped and guided an awful lot of people. History, it is said, turns on small hinges. A little wheat and a little flour, and every day they ate a little their cakes. Every day they ate and ate and ate. Each day they were reminded that God could be trusted to provide for another day. And every day they ate that cake, their faith grew just a little, maybe morsel by morsel, but their faith continued to grow just a little bit each day. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is entering the city of Nain by the gates and he meets this funeral procession that's coming out and the dead were always buried too at the gate just beyond the gate just beyond the city walls and without compassion he touched the deceased a strict no-no in Jewish law and this dead body rises and is returned back to his widow mother not so different from Elijah's widow woman in her thanksgiving for what had happened with her son. Life had come back to him and to her as well. To them both, God proved to be, uh, well, uh, proved to be one who could provide. Old Testament Hebrew calls it Jehovah Jireh the one who provides. Jesus shared with that woman of a God who could raise the dead that day, maybe foreshadowing in some way his own resurrection. There's a lot of hand-wringing going on today. And storms are on the horizon. And it might seem if we are close to dying sometimes in our life or as a community or as a church or as a nation, things are changing. The world itself is, seems to be in this little rumbling stage where volcanoes are erupting and droughts are happening and monsoons are going on and, and the cracks might seem to be a little bit bigger today than they were the last year. The environmental social, political, economic storms, the storms in here, inside us. Whether it's the still 
not quite yet gone, COVID-19 that's still around, or the Russia, Chinese, and Korean potential use of nuclear arms, or the unrest over race that dates back to forever, or the former president's indictment, or the church splits and fractures that have been occurring in the last couple of weeks in our brothers' and sisters' churches, we wonder, how can we survive? I'm a bit of a lurker on Facebook. I'm not anywhere near what my wife is, but I call her the queen. But I kind of lurk every now and then and see where things are and see what people are saying. And yesterday I was shocked at some of the comments that I saw from people that I know and respect about some of the political news, recent political news, and the claims that often accompany such news, at least on social media. These weren't the folks that I knew. The people that I was reading weren't the people that I knew and respected in their places and in their uh, status in the society around us. Everybody has an agenda, I get that, but these people who I thought to be thinking people and rational people were suddenly reactive. We've gotta do this, we've gotta do that, we've gotta wring our hands a little more and worry and, and say it's all gonna come down on us all. And if we could just get rid of them or bring them in or have these folks or get this, then it will be okay. Well, maybe. There's still a lot of fear among us in this world and in this country and in our state and in our localities. A lot of fear, even among Christian churches today, that we're close to dying and folding up and, and being uh, not the church that we used to be 50 years ago, that we're, we are dying, that our way of life and our status and our freedoms are in great jeopardy, and we wring our hands in this great hand-wringing event of history, and we want to say, if only, and, and if that was just this way, and, and we start pointing fingers again, and Quite a few years ago, while still in church ministry, I volunteered to take a cut in salary to help out the church's financial bottom line. It was supposed to be temporary. <laughs> Pastoral staff, don't ever do that. <laughs> it was, uh, I wrote a letter to the congregation and explained that this little cut in salary wasn't going to put the church on financial, solid financial ground. It might help them a little bit, but it wasn't going to put them on solid financial ground because it was going to take several shifts. It was going to take the church membership to step up in its tithing and its giving on weekly, monthly ties brought about by a new and renewed heart and a spirit and the one who can assure life even when it seems impossible that life can ever happen again. It's going to take a shift from a consumer mentality, I said, from that says I'll pay for what I can feel or touch or see or the pew that I happen to be sitting in or I'll pay for the communion bread or I'll pay for the pastor and because I'm paying for the pastor, the pastor does what I want. To a shift from all of that to a, to a thought of generosity, of thankfulness for the little moments when God sends agents into our life to remind us that in spite of what seems to be happening around us, that all, in fact, will be well because of the faith that is ours through Jesus Christ. And the third shift was following, like Elijah, God's call to go. To go out to the least and the last and the lost around us. If you're here as a member of this congregation or if you're just checking out the the ministry here, I hope that you can or are beginning to practice those three shifts. It's still possible to be the church today of Jesus Christ in this new environment that we find ourselves in. It will not be like the environment of even 10, 15 years ago, much less 50 years ago. But the church will still survive. 
Because God is still providing new life, raising from the dead, providing for our daily needs all the time. We just open our eyes a little wider and look and see and behold and give thanks. When I took that pay cut, I wrote that letter because I believed in a God who could provide for us, and somehow God did, even in our personal life. I'll tell you, it was 20%. And I was a small church pastor. We ate a lot of ramen noodles. There was never an overabundance of money in the church, but the bills got paid, and there was enough. Every day, every week, every month, every year, there was enough. The meal never ran out. The oil was always there. Life was always abundant. I can say these things today because I still believe in a God who can give back life even in the face of death. If I didn't, I wouldn't have given up that salary. This gathering, this worship this morning is like being at the gates of those cities the places where both women in our stories this morning, the widows at Zarephath and Nain, they met someone who changed what they looked like. They met someone who changed the way they looked at the next day and the day after that and the day after that. They met someone who changed the understanding that the status quo of life doesn't have to be the status quo of life, that something is possible with Jesus Christ in our midst, with God at work in our life, that life itself is very possible and real to those who claim that life instead of sitting back and wringing hands. We can't mend every tear in the fabric of our society. We can't pay, you can't pay everyone's bills who come to you seeking assistance. There has to be a system set up to handle that. You can't prevent the heartaches and the grief of loss, the terrors that strike us at night, the storms that come. We can't control the Fed's interest rates or what the person in the White House hides or doesn't hide but we can control how we respond to all of that. At these gates, in this humanness, our own brokenness, maybe in our emptiness, at these gates we find that we're not alone. There is a community of faith here that's moving and encouraging and standing next to us to hold us when those storms of life do rage because there is hope always hope and forgiveness and healing and new life in the face of death to all who pass through these gates and beyond. It's easy to believe in the death-dealing powers of the world and believe that those powers have the upper hand over life. Goodness, just watch the nightly news broadcasts. The formats are the same. I've, I've done a little bit of a, of, a, of a looking at all three channels, and they all have the same format. They tell you all the bad news, and then they have a little break, and then they tell you one little piece of good news as, this, as a teaser, and then they tell you this really heartwarming news piece at the end of the, uh, end of the 30 minutes. Look at the news outlets, the media outlets, and the apps on your phone. I'm getting where I don't even read them anymore. It's this death and that death and this highway wreck and that highway wreck because of something that's going on and this shooting. It's just, it can really, it's easy to be swayed by the death-dealing powers at work in our world. It's much harder to believe in the hope that is ours 
the hope that is always ours, not only for this not yet time, but for the now time, today, on this Sunday in June, for in the now time, God is still at work at the gates, bringing God's truth to whoever will listen, whomever will listen and engage and be a part of that community. Matthew writes in his gospel, seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and all these things will be added to you. All of these things, not just this little slice or that little slice, but all of these things can be handed and added to you. Charles Tindley was the son of slaves and he worked as a janitor in a Methodist church. And after he taught himself to read and to write, he began to write poetry and hymns and stories. He actually went back to work for the church in which he was a janitor as their pastor later in his life. And he penned the words that Ken sang earlier in the service. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the hosts of hell assail and my faith begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. God did not fail the widow at Nain and didn't fail the widow at Zarephath. Brothers and sisters, God will not fail us either. May we meet at those gates and listen to that truth and claim it for our lives this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Jim. You blessed us today. Thank you. Join me in our affirmation of faith, please. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. It's on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our hymn 265, Jesus shall reign wherever the sun does its excessive journey run. Please stand. <laughs>
hope in your life. Hope not that uh, is, uh, is waning in a, uh, in a world that we hope to be back to, but a hope that is in the world that is yet to come, the one that comes this afternoon or tomorrow or next week or next year or the next 10 years, a hope that drives us forward with excitement because we have been a part of this resurrection. We have been a part of this new life that has come to us. We have been a part of this joy that is a part of, that is in our life, that is in our hearts. And it, it compels us to go and to live that life of hope. So go. And as you leave this place, may the God of life go with you and the Lord of love encircle you with his love and the fellowship and the communion of the Spirit of God be with you now and remain with you forevermore. Amen. Comfort sleep.